Warning, the following podcast contains elements relating to child trafficking that some viewers may find upsetting and disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. I'm the founder of over 20 plus companies. The largest one is a 43 billion dollar real estate investment fund. We're the number one performing real estate investment fund of our of our kind for the first 10 years that I was running it. We're the top at, um, emerging managers worldwide. So these principles that I'm teaching you now, although they were starting out small, I use these same principles when we built huge companies later. The importance of learning how to sell, the importance of learning how to handle rejection, and the, the importance of always consuming knowledge, which obviously is, is uh, I guess, a translation of what, what you meant by saying that, uh, you know, let's hope your car radio doesn't work. And you <laughs> exactly. wheels. I guess, you know, listening to audio books, you know, consuming knowledge on the move. If you listen no further to this podcast and just take those three things away with you, it is the guaranteed route to success. Yeah, it'll, it'll change your life right there. Guys, Matt Haycock's here, and welcome to another episode of The Matt Haycock Show. And I've got a guest and a theme today that I'm very interested in, and I know you guys are going to be as well, because it's, it's actually something that we've never covered on here before. I mean, I've had many, many business owners. Probably most of my podcasts have been with business owners and talked something entrepreneurial, which is what we're also going to do with this guest. But Paul Hutchison is also involved in, in uh, child trafficking. Well, not, not involved in child trafficking, in, in, in involved in, in rescue missions, rescuing children from child trafficking. And he's actually, we've just been talking a little bit before we started recording this, and he's been undercover for the last 10 years. It's only recently in the last few weeks that he's actually even started started talking publicly about this. So I'm super excited to hear the story, super excited to dig deep. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about his entrepreneurial background. We're going to talk about how he mentors people, how he talks to royalty, to billionaires, to audiences all around the world. I'm sure there's plenty I'm going to learn and there's plenty that you guys are definitely going to learn too. So Paul, thanks a lot for being here. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me on your show. Super grateful, Matt. I feel like I've already got to apologize for the introduction because it's the first time I've introduced anyone as a child trafficker, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> obviously, obviously not, not what I meant, but um, listen, let's, we, we, we're going to go deep on that soon. Uh, and I, I know that probably c comes later in your story, but let's, let's just talk about how it all began. What's the beginning of the journey for Paul? How did your entrepreneurial background start? Absolutely. Well, I, I, I always wanted to be a business owner, but uh, my dad always told me I would I, I wasn't qualified for it because I wasn't very good at kissing butt. And he and his company had to start at the bottom and work his way all the way up. And, and so I, I was encouraged to go into something else. And so I wanted to go into medicine. I wanted to be a doctor. Uh, I wanted to be a, a pediatric cardiologist, not a, not a regular doctor, but a surgeon, not a regular surgeon, but a heart surgeon, not a regular heart surgeon, but a one that, that operates on children and helps children. And I got a lot of my college done in high school. I, in college, I, I was about two months away from taking the MCAT and I got in a major car accident and I, I severed the tendons in my hand and they didn't know if I'd have the ability, the dexterity to be a surgeon. And so they told me, Paul, you can, you can be a regular doctor. And, and I said, I said, I don't want to be a regular anything. I, if I'm going to be a garbage man, I'm going to own the dump. You know, that's just how I think I, I, I'm, I got one life to live. I'm going to live it. And so. I had a, a friend of the family who was uh, pretty successful in business as an entrepreneur and gave me some tips. He said, Paul, he said, you have a unique gift with people. He said, why do you want to be a doctor anyway? I said, oh, I'll be honest. I'll want the money, you know, I'll go to school for 12 years so I can drive a Ferrari someday. And, and he said, he said, you know, you ought to sit down with a doctor and ask him about his lifestyle, a surgeon who's where you want to be. And I did, I, I actually took the, the surgeon that did the work on my hand. I took him to lunch and I asked him, I said, tell me about your lifestyle. And he said, well, he says, I got a beautiful home, got nice cars, got a motor home, part ownership in a plane. He said, I've, I've got two teenage kids and I don't even know what he said, I, I, I work a hundred hours a week to maintain the lifestyle for my wife and kids. And, and I can't retire because I'm tied to my beeper. And, and it was, and I, I realized, wow, that even though he's at that level, if you're trading time for money, for things, you do it forever. And so I went back to, to this, this mentor guy and I said, Matt, tell me his name was Matt too, ironically, Matt. So, and I said, I said, tell me, wh what are you thinking here? And he said, Paul, he said, if you, if you do what I teach you to do, you'll be a millionaire by the time you're 30 and you'll have the time to enjoy it. And for me, the, the combination of time and money both was way more intriguing than just having a Ferrari, right? Having the ability to really enjoy your life 
was was super valuable. And so I said, okay, what do I do? And he said, Paul, he said, every good business owner knows how to handle rejection and knows how to sell. He said, I suggest that you, you find the hardest rejection job you can possibly find and I'll mentor you from there. So I did, I found a job at a call center, cold calling, selling children's videos. And, uh, but I didn't wanna ever sell anything I didn't believe in. And I was already dedicated my life wanting to help children and in, in being a heart surgeon. So this one, they were, they were selling videos that help kids with stranger danger and honesty and re, you know, just some fun little videos that have help parents teach kids these, these principles. And so I, I, long story short, I'm not gonna go into the details unless we want to on that, but well, actually I will. For entrepreneurs and your, your program, I think this is super important. He told me a few things. He said, Paul, when you're there, you need to work to learn. Don't work to earn. He said, if you're there for a paycheck, you're wasting your time. If your goal is to be an entrepreneur and, and run your own company, then while you're here trading time for money, you need to be educating yourself, learning. And so he, he had me find the best guys that were there. There was average guy was making 20 sales a week. There's two guys making 70. And he had me take them out to lunch on my dime and learn from them everything they're doing. And pretty soon I was making over 70 sales a week within weeks. He also said, Paul, your car should be a university on wheels. From now on, the rest of your life, I don't even want you to know if your car radio works. Now for your, for your listeners, just so you kind of know, because I don't know if we handled this in the, but, but I'm, I'm the founder of over 20 plus companies. The largest one is a $43 billion real estate investment fund. And uh, we, we, we're the number one performing real estate investment fund of our, of our kind for the first 10 years that I was running it. We're the top at, um, emerging managers worldwide. So these principles that I'm teaching you now, although they were starting out small, I use these same principles when we built huge companies later, if that makes sense. So no, hundred percent, hundred percent. And I tell you, I mean, we, we've we've only been talking five minutes, but you know, if, if if anyone switches off or gets cut cut off at this point, I think you know those three things we just talked about: the importance of learning how to sell, the importance of learning how to handle rejection, and the the importance of always consuming knowledge, which obviously is is uh, I guess the translation of what what you meant by saying that uh, you know let's hope your car radio doesn't work and you. <laughs> exactly. Wheels, I guess, you know, listening to audio books, you know, consuming knowledge on the move. If you listen no further to this podcast and just take those three things away with you, it is the guaranteed route to success. Yeah, it'll, it'll change your life right there. In fact, it's funny, years later, my kids told me, they said, Dad, the only reason why you like 80s music is that's the last thing you ever heard. Because <laughs> because I I just consumed audio programs on business and leadership and success and all of these things that I could learn from other people. In fact, you know what's interesting? I had a guy the other day and he told me he said, "Oh, Paul, he said I would love to meet like Tony Robbins. I'd love to be have a one on one meeting with him and have have a chat with him like like you do and have that." And I and I asked him this. I said, "What do you think that he would teach you one on one that you're not already learning in his books and his tapes and everything else? A lot of these great." mentor leaders, you don't have to know them personally for them to be a great mentor for you because they're putting their great stuff that they can send out to the world in their books and tapes and things like that. So that's what I did. I consumed all that stuff. In fact, years later, I, I ended up buying LeBron James's Range Rover. And this thing had like $60,000 subwoofers in the back of it. And my, my kids are like, dad, what are you gonna do? Listen to all of your, your self-help audio programs on those $60,000 subwoofers. And I said, I said, the reason I could afford that car is because I was listening to that stuff. And so they started soaking it in themselves as well. So yes, that transformed my life and those habits actually started when I was a teenager I, I, I I'm gonna back up just a little bit because these things I think are vitally important to the whole story especially as an entrepreneur in my when I was like 14 15 years old I wasn't that popular in school I was I, I, I buck teeth when I was younger and then I had braces and just having a hard time and so I went into my dad and I said dad how 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 can I make friends? How can I be successful? What is the key to success? And he gave me two gifts that completely changed my life. One of them was a, 
was a book that he had had since he was a teenager called How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie, classic. It was all tattered and stuff, an old uh, black book, but I realized at that point in reading that, that every person that I talk to is a thousand times more interested in them than they are me. And if I can use a, a drop of honey instead of a gallon of gall, I can attract more and understanding that interpersonal relationship skills and really talking and understanding people changed my life. And then the second thing, which was so powerful, was an audio program by Brian Tracy called The Psychology of Achievement. And this was one of his first ones, the classic one way back, what was this, 40 years ago, 35 years ago? And I listened to that program, Matt, so many times that I actually broke, I had those old audio those cassette tapes, you know, I listened to it so many times that it broke and I have to tape it back together and screw it up with a pencil to give it back in. But that taught me that literally everything in my life I could create through my actions, through my words, and even my thoughts were bringing about these things in, into my life step by step that I, I didn't just have to pound it and pound it and do the work. But the most important part was changing my mindset where I needed to look in the mirror and shave a millionaire before I became a millionaire. I needed to see myself as a man of integrity to bring that into my life. I needed to see myself as, as fit and healthy. And that visualization started bringing those, those, those truths into my life. And especially when it came to business success, it would attract the right people, attract the right circumstances and to visualize this world of abundance. Somebody asked me earlier today, he said, he's in, a, in another conversation, he said, Paul, he said, when you, when you arrived, you know, when you were able to buy this, this massive mansion, when you were able to buy these cars, you know, how did it feel? How did, how, how, was that like totally out of, I said, you know what? It actually felt exactly like I imagined it would because your imagination sets the stage for your future. So those were all things that kind of formatted things in the beginning. And I, I built this, uh, um, this company, my very first successful company was the Midwest Center for Stress and Anxiety. We had an audio program that helped people overcome anxiety and stress disorders. It was completely in line with my mission of I'm going to make a powerful positive impact in the lives of others at the same time that I'm creating value in the way of money coming back to us. And so being able to put together a program where I could truly help people change the negative patterns of thought, just like I did when I was 14, change those negative habit patterns of thought that were creating anxiety and depression in the first place. I sold that company for over $20 million when I was 29 years old. And that's where we entered into being able to start building the fund. So that's well, it. Let's, <laughs> well, look, let's talk about that fund then, because the numbers are obviously astronomical. I think um, my, my notes had 40 billion, but I think I think we, we spoke earlier, you said 40, 43 billion uh, ass, assets under management under there. I think like something like 2000 employees. I mean, what was the concept? What was the genesis of the fund when it started? And how did you go about scaling a business to that size? Yeah, so uh, I, I started out with one partner, me and a man named John Pennington. In the beginning, we, we started a fund called Bridge Loan capital. We were doing short-term, hard money lending, asset-based lending. And, and where it came about is that the company that bought my marketing company when I was 29, they had some, they had some products that they were buying out of, out of Asia and they were selling to Best Buy and other things like that. And they needed some float. They needed a 30 day purchase order financing type of a thing. So we started out doing hard money loans or purchase order financing for companies that, that were, were doing that. For example, if you, if you had a, a widget that you invented and you were having it manufactured in Asia, and you, you have to pay the manufacturer a half a million dollars for the order, but you have an, a fulfillment order from Best Buy that's gonna pay you a million dollars as soon as it arrives at Best Buy. But you somehow need to float that 30 days and getting it over here. So that's what we would do. We John had done $9 million a year in import export, and he knew how to make sure we didn't lose a container full of, of widgets coming in from China and make sure we got paid for it. So that's where we started. And then we, we we transitioned over into real estate about a year later. But in the beginning, lending lending on real estate or lending. buying it. 
Exactly. So in the beginning, we were doing loans. We were doing bridge loans. So that's where the bridge name came from of the company. And, and when we were first started, John and I were in this little teeny office. I mean, we built it up to $10 million under management in this office that was so small, we, we would hit elbows when we turned around or if we stood up together, our, our, our chairs would hit. That's how small it was. And we were paying like $300 a month for this little office. And where, where, where were you raising the capital from? Um, high net worth investors. And, and I was clueless at the time. I did, you know, I, would, I had come from a marketing background and I told John, well, let's, let's just put a billboard out and whatever. And he said, no, he said, this is a private offering memorandum. And we can only bring in high net worth investors. And I remember writing on a piece of paper, where do I find high net worth investors? And I, I started writing things on there. Okay, what do they hang out at the, the high end, really expensive gym? Are they front row seats at the at the, the NBA teams? You know, what where, where are they? And one of the things I wrote on there was, charity work and i realized a lot of these ultra wealthy guys and and their families were were now involved in trying to really make a difference so i served on a bunch of different boards of directors of different charities for two purposes number one i believe that choosing to give back even when you don't have the money will energetically create more coming in. In fact, my mentor back in my early 20s, he said, Paul, if you make a decision today that you're going to give 20% of your money and 20% of your time to making a significant impact in the lives of others, he said the rewards coming back will not only be happiness rewards, they'll be financial rewards as well. You can call it the universe, you can call it God, you can call it karma, you can call it whatever you want to. I believe there's a higher power very interested in us doing good Good and making a difference in the world. And because of that, I've seen massive success come in my businesses by being involved in charity. And I met a lot of the high net worth guys in that charity world as well. So back to me and John, we're in this little teeny office and John tells the story all the time. So they say, John, how did you guys get so big from where you were? And he'll say, Paul had the vision right from the beginning. We'd be sitting in this little office and I'd be making phone calls, trying to raise like, we needed $25,000 more for a project that we were trying to fund by Friday. And John would say, you know, Paul be in there making calls, making calls, making calls. And about halfway through the calls, Paul would hang up the phone and he'd turn around and he'd put his little pinky right here on his, on his lip and he'd say, John, we're going to be a billion dollar fund someday. <laughs> and John, John said, I just said, Paul, we need $25,000 by Friday right? He, he couldn't see that. But, but then we would sit down and talk and he would say, Paul, listen, you know that neither you or I have the education or the pedigree to run a multi-billion dollar investment fund. And I said, yes, John, but if we build it right from the beginning, if we build it with integrity, and this is what I loved about John is that he built everything with integrity. He crossed every T, dotted every I. And I said, we build it with integrity and we have the vision of what we want to create. We will attract the right people that will allow us to build this company. And that's exactly what happened is that, that as we built this, this company with the right foundation, we didn't cut any corners or anything. We spent a lot of our own money with making sure all the paperwork was right with the Securities Exchange Commission and everything else so that it was done right from the beginning. And sure enough, we were able to attract rock stars, like unbelievably decorated pedigree type people that came on as our partners because they saw what me and John were putting together and the vision of where it was going. And tell me, as, as the fund developed up to the up to the billion, you know, billion plus to the 40 or billion it is now, has the mandate of the fund changed? I mean, is, is, it, is it still bridge lending or is, is, no, is it doing yeah. it? I mean, Here's what happened. Back in 2006, John and I, we had, we had got it to the point where we had loans out on about a hundred million dollars worth of property. And we hired a guy named Don Hartman. Don's resume was the most impressive piece of paper that I'd ever seen. He had run the financial institutions division for Citigroup in Asia. He had raised $14 billion to bail out the Asian debt crisis in the late 90s. This guy was qualified. He, he jokes and said, yeah, Paul found me walking around Salt Lake City with an unemployed sign, I'll work for equity, right? I mean, this guy was overqualified for everything in, in Utah. And we brought him on to help us have the 
look and feel necessary to go after the bigger institutional investors because I didn't know how to get there. I knew that we, with the audited financials of the returns that we had, I knew we could go to Morgan Stanley and have them write a, a $300 million check, but I didn't know how to get there. And so we brought Don on to help us not only have the pedigree with him there, but to help us have the, the, the look and feel as a company to get to that point. And then Don comes into my office. We're still doing these bridge loans. He comes to my office. It's uh, December of 2006. And this is a year and a half before the, the 2008 crash. And he comes into my office and he said, Paul, we're in trouble. I said, like, we like the fund, the company? He goes, no, we like the whole country. He said, probably the whole world. And he had all these third order polynomial equations that were way over my head. And he said, I've been looking at the numbers. He said, I think we're looking at a multi-trillion dollar problem. And if you don't change, you're going to be upside down with everybody in this space. He said, but if we position ourselves right, we'll be able to take advantage of the greatest buying opportunity in real estate that we're going to see in our lifetime. And he said, here's what's important, Paul. You're really good at talking to people. You're really good at raising money. He said, you're really good. You and John have put together something. You're really good at running a fund and doing all the paperwork. He said, you don't know crap about real estate. <laughs> you know? He said, because all you're doing is just the lending and the valuation. In a crash like this, lend will be owners. So I suggest we augment the team and bring on some people who are true real estate adults who understand how to manage it. And then in real estate, he said, there's a lot of different asset classes and some of them do great in the good times and horrible in the bad times. Other ones do pretty good in the good times and still pretty good in the bad times. And I said, okay, what, what are we talking about here? And he said, I suggest we start with B class multifamily. Uh, apartment complexes that are a dollar a square foot per month type of a thing. Things that the average worker is gonna be able to afford. And not the high end stuff, he says, cause when the crash happens, the crash will hit that really hard. Not land and things, farmer type stuff, that'll, that'll, that'll not, it'll take a while to develop that, et cetera. He said, but everybody needs a place to live and B-class multifamily will, will do really, really well. And so we started looking around to find some team members and we were bridge loan capital. We found a group called Bridge Property Management that had a 20 year track record in managing apartment complexes with a 20% per year return. And so we brought them on as, as partners. We combined together and created Bridge Loan Capital, Bridge Property Management. We created Bridge Investment Group. They had never run a fund before, but they knew how to manage property really well. And from there, now we, and, and because Don saw the writing on the wall before the crash happened, we got in the right position at the right time. We got rid of any of our lending, any assets that were gonna really cause us problems and we got in a strong cash position. And we became one of the first funds in the country to be qualified on a top level purchasing platform with all the GSEs, Freddie Fannie, HUD, FDIC. So when a bank was ready to fail, we would get a call and we were able to go in and buy these things at pennies on the dollar. And we created a win-win-win, even for the bank, because at this point, the bank president's willing to negotiate. He realizes 30 days from now, the FDIC takes him over, he's out of a job, and his shareholders have a big fat zero. Or we go in and we can buy a hundred million dollar portfolio for $30 million and he gets the liquidity he needs. We're able to take this apartment complex that wasn't being managed well by the bank and create added value and create a win, not only for the bank, but now for the tenants as well, because we know how to manage those apartments and create that extra value and sell them. We ended up with a 40 plus percent IRR return in 2009, in 2010, 2011, where the rest of the market was crashing and lost 30 and 50%. So listening to somebody like Don, bringing on the right team, being in the right place at the right time, allowed us to create a powerfully strong foundation to catapult us to where they are today. And what do you do with those properties over the long term? I mean, do, you, do you keep them for the, for the long term hold, the long term yield, or, or no, once they're at right, right, you flip them? Yeah, we're, we're a fix and flip on a big scale, right? So we, we would find properties that needed uh, some love in some way. They needed to have what I call a story. Either they had a messed up management team or messed up marketing strategy, or, or they, they have value add improvements on the property themselves. And so we would, we would buy these ones that were mismanaged and 
We would put in our management skills and then we would do things like we would make sure that what we were doing was not only right for our investors, but it was right for the tenants as well. For example, a lot of our apartment complexes were in areas that were, were heavily uh, Latin American, Hispanics that were coming in in these areas. And a lot of these apartment complexes were you know, the B class ones that were built, you know, 20 plus years before. They had tennis courts and stuff, but they, they had four foot weeds growing in the tennis courts and our tenants didn't play tennis, right? The, the, the Hispanic people, they, 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 they like soccer. Right. So we took down the nets and we put little soccer fields in and we create little soccer leagues. We bring in English as a second language and the bookmobile and a tutoring program and Taco Tuesday and all these beautiful things that blended with the culture of our primary people that were living there created a good, safe place to live. We, we didn't put gold towel rods in a, in a B class neighborhood. Right. But, but we're going to make sure that we have a, a workstation place there for people to bring their kids to with tutoring and things like that. And so bringing that kind of value, as well as making sure that the pools were taken care of and that they had the soccer leagues in place, that kind of value allowed us to take the properties up to a 97% success rate our 90% occupancy rate and hold it that long enough where then we could sell it off to a read or something that could just go ahead and clip the coupon and, and, and make a return for them. But we're getting a massive return. We averaged a 23.2 net per year return for our investors over a 15 year period. That's fantastic. So this is, this is all a, a, because of listening and finding the right people, not being intimidated to bring on power players on our team and listening to them when they saw the writing on the wall. And then we could take, they, they, they say that you make money when there's blood in the streets. That's true. But I don't like to make money from the blood on the streets. I like to make money from creating the, the first aid kits to help people that have the that, that, are, that are having a challenge when that happens, if that makes sense. No, of course. And, t and tell me, because I mean, obviously running running billion dollar businesses is, is something that 99% of the world only ever get to read about. What would you say are, if any, the material differences that you've noticed in running something of that scale? Or is it is it just as when, when you go from a million to 10, 10 to 100, 100 to a billion, billion to 40 billion, are there massive shifts in, in, in methods of operation? Or is it just doing the same thing at scale, but being more organized? Yes, the, the key you've got to you've got to have systems for everything. Systems for everything, so that you can duplicate it on a mass scale. So we we created those systems when we were small to make sure that they would work perfectly when when they're bigger. In fact, a lot of us as founders, you know, John and I, we we kind of did everything in the beginning. In fact, a, a funny story when I right before I retired, I, I retired in 2017 uh, just to focus full time on charity work. But right before I retired, and now I'm still I'm still a founder, I'm still an owner and the GP of the funds, et cetera, but I got way smarter people than me that are running the show. And, but right before I retired, one of the we had we had actually 4,000 employees back then. We've scaled down the employees and outsourced some of the things since that time. But so at the time I retired, we had about 4,000 employees. We had 70 plus employees that were in accounting alone. One of them, his name was Andrew. He was new there and didn't know the history of the company. And he comes and his job that day was to have the partner sign up on our expense reports. And so he comes in and, and on my expense report, I've got I've got trips to Dubai and you know, I've got front row seats at NBA games and nice restaurants with wealthy people. And he asked me, he I'm signing off on it. And he said, Paul, he said, he didn't say Paul, he said, Mr. Hutchinson, he said, do you mind me asking, how did you get your job? And I realized he didn't know the history of the company. And I said, well, what do you mean? He goes, well, you, you have, you have the best job in the whole company. All you do is fly around and go to lunch with rich people. Cause I was, you know, I was capital markets at the time. And so I decided to mess with him a little bit. And I said, well, Andrew, I, I used to do what you do. He goes, really? You were in accounting? I said, yeah, I had that, which I was, and when it was just me and John, right? And I said, yeah, I had it. I had a, a spreadsheet, this the Excel spreadsheet that I was keeping track of the net asset valuations of all of the investors and the fund and all of this stuff. And it was like 70 megabyte spreadsheet. I said, and then Adam worked for our accounting, uh, for, for our auditor. Now, Adam is now his boss, right? I said, so Adam came in and did all of our, our audits. And he said, Paul, he said, 
all of your numbers are right, but there's a hell of a lot easier ways of doing it than what you're doing. I said, so I got replaced by Adam, you know? So basically I hired Adam to take my place. And then he said, I, I said, and then I did what Jonathan does. He goes, really, you were underwriting assets? Yeah, I have this huge stack of papers in which I was going through all of these assets and trying to figure out what the values were, et cetera. And every night I went home with a headache. And so we got, I got replaced by Jonathan. And so I said, the only thing I was any good at was going to rich with, going to lunch with rich people. So that's where they put me. And so, so then he's like, well, holy crap. He said, so how many people were here when you started? I said, just me and John. So the, the principle I'm teaching there is as an entrepreneur, learn every part of your business, but don't be afraid of hiring somebody who's way better than you at each one of those areas as you grow. Perfect. Perfect. Well, listen, I want to go on to talk about the work, the charity work, the, um, the the child trafficking and your involvement in that. But just before we do, just want to kind of wrap up the entrepreneurial side with a, with a question that someone's uh, someone's asked us in Facebook here, actually. Sure. Uh, which um, says, I'll read it out. It says, you can only get a loan if you have equity. So what's your advice for me on my business? Because I have no equity, but my business venture is six years of knowledge. I've produced nine journals, but I've written 52. What's your advice on how I can develop all 52 i mean i guess i guess the um the the, the summary of the question is is uh you know, how how do you go and find equity investors you know how, how do you raise capital for a small business absolutely and, and here's here's the answer there's different types of equity you know there's there's physical value equity which we did when we were doing the bridge loans and stuff we have to say okay if, if you've got a property that's worth five million dollars i'll loan you three million dollars on it so i i have a good loan to value type of a thing but but somebody like this gentleman he's got equity in his assets his knowledge his experience etc so those cut type of lenders are not going to be your traditional lenders. They're not going to be the banks. They're going to be more private lenders or guys who are, who are willing to come in with uh, with some sort of an equity stake. So you know, if he's got if he's got some great ideas, if he's got a track record, that is equity. That that is there's value there. There's value in his experience. There's value in what he's created so far. And so somebody who who understands that value, somebody who's maybe has some money that that has has been in the in in the same industry as him would be a great person to go to who could say hey i believe in you i'm going to lend you money on this or i'll i'll take a piece of your company as we're building it etc so so yeah that's those are less traditional but there's there's equity there for somebody who understands the value of your company you no know, i'm i'm loving this chat i got to say i mean obviously you and i never got chance to speak uh, speak too much before we started but there's so many sim similarities uh, in, in our in our story in our business, my core business is uh, what you guys in America call hard, hard money lending. Uh, you know, so I mean, I mean, I, I I spend my days having lunch with rich people to um, to raise capital so that I can deploy it on the, on secured debt in the UK. So many of your principles are either either things that I operate or be, or believe in or try and operate and believe in myself. So I'm certainly getting some good value here, and I know I know the guys who get to watch and listen to this will will be also. So it's been great having you here so far. Listen, let's let's take a let's take a, a dramatic swift and from you know from building billion dollar funds and talk about your work in rescue missions for child trafficking and you know, I mean how, how that came about and uh, I mean how, how do you even get involved in that space yeah this is a super unique it's not something that the average person uh, would even even want to be involved with but as we touched on earlier I made a commitment in my early 20s that I would donate a significant amount of my money and my time to making a difference in the lives of others into charity and so I, I served on a number of different charity boards I was on the, the Make-A-Wish Board of Directors uh, for seven years. I was the incoming chairman for Make-A-Wish here in Utah when, when I got a call from a friend of mine who's now the Attorney General in Utah. Uh, his name is Sean. And Sean introduced me to a man who was part of Homeland Security working in child trafficking. And he came to this, we had a guy's movie night and he showed up there and, and I was like, oh, we got his movie night. I don't want to be listening to this guy and him trying to raise money for his, his charity, whatever. But we gave him the, the chance to speak and it changed my life. Matt, this guy started talking about the fastest growing criminal enterprise in the world, which, I mean, this is a dark subject and I'm not going to go deep into this dark subject, but I am going to say this. There's 
more today, and I'm not talking about just children being abused at home, I'm talking about sold human beings, there's more today than all 300 years of the, of the transatlantic slave trade put together. So he, he talks about how he found some children in Cartagena, Colombia and was putting together this, this rescue mission. He thought there was 20 of them down there. He then calls me a couple of weeks later and he said, Paul, he said, and we had helped to raise some money to, to help rescue these, these 20 children. And these children were being sold for horrible things. They were kidnapped and abducted children and whatnot. And- I mean, I was just gonna ask, I mean, I know it's probably a naive question, but it's, you know, it's not really my area of specialism. I mean, what, what, what happens to these kids when the traffic, I, I mean, are they being, tra are they being trafficked for, you know, for the sex trade or, or to be made to be made into illegal workers or do some people no, just no. Yeah. The rest yeah all the ones that we're doing are being sold for organ harvesting and sex trafficking wow. um, the eight million children that are being sold for those type of things is what we focus on there is eight million. eight million now there's a way bigger number if you're talking about labor uh, children that are underage, there were labor trafficking, etc. But I'm talking sold human beings that are being sold specifically for sex trafficking and organ harvesting. So mm -hmm. this is why nobody talks about it. It's a dark subject, right? And so, so I get this call, and he said, Paul, he said, I'm I'm here in Cartagena, Colombia. There's not just 20 children here. There's more than 50 that are part of this ring. He said, and there's more than 100 children in the surrounding in other cities down here that we believe are tied to the same trafficking organizations. He said, we have a plan that we could rescue all 100 plus children at the same time on the same day and get them back to their families. He said, this will be the largest child rescue operation in one day in history. Now, the, the story that I'm telling you right here is coming out in a movie later this year. We've already filmed it. The name of the movie is called The Sound of Freedom. And the uh, the actor who plays the Homeland Security agent is Jim Caviezel. Jim played Jesus and Passion of the Christ and Count of Monte Cristo. He was the Count. The, the actor who plays me, is named Eduardo Verastegui. Eduardo is one of the more famous actors in Mexico. And because we filmed it while I was still doing a lot of undercover work, he doesn't play Paul Hutchinson. He plays Pablo Delgado, the billion dollar fund manager who quits his job to go rescue kids, right? The, the, the Hispanic Paul Hutchinson. Exactly, Pablo. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so, so the story I'm telling you is the storyline of that. It starts out with with uh, Tim, the Homeland Security agent, who's starting out in anti-trafficking work that ends up coming into starting a foundation. And that's the one who called me while I was in, in the US and he was in Colombia. And he said, we have a plan that we could rescue all 100 children at the same time, but I need your help in a big way. And I'm like, ah, what do you need? You need any money? Should I write you a check? He said, no, bigger than that. If you can be in Colombia in two days, you can be part of this massive operation. And I said, well, why me? What, what, what do you need from me? And he said, well, he said the head trafficker down here has a piece of property that he wants to develop into a child brothel sex resort, just like Jeffrey Epstein has. It's actually an island that he wanted to develop. He believes he can make tens of millions of dollars a year bringing horrible people down here to do horrible things, but he needs $8 million to develop it. He said, I can't teach my Navy SEALs how to negotiate this deal with them. He said, if you can be here in two days and play that role, then I believe that, that I said, well, what do you want me to do? He said, well, you let him know that you're willing to fund his $8 million project under one condition. In two weeks, we're going to have a party and you're going to bring down a bunch of your buddies. And if he calls all of his friends, all of his connections that are traffickers and have them bring all their children to the same place on the same day, he said, we'll perform the sting at that time and we'll rescue all those children. He said, tell him that the only way you're going to fund his project is if he performs and, and shows you that he, he can provide that many kids. So he knew more about my background than most people. I have a special set of skills from previous training, et cetera, but more importantly, he needed my ability to negotiate a real estate deal. So two days later, I'm in Colombia. I'm face to face with the most evil people I've ever encountered, selling eight, 10 year old children. There's four people sitting across this table from us. There's three guys, one female. She was Miss Cartagena. She had this 
fake modeling agency. She was going to towns in South America and telling the parents, oh, your daughter's too pretty to be working in the field. She should be a model. And the parents would bring them to their photo shoots and boom, they would disappear. So all of this is in the movie and it just follows the story of some of these children that were brought in. So I'm sitting there at this table. We negotiate this, this deal and they were so excited that we were willing to take a look at it that over the next two weeks, he called all these other traffickers. And sure enough, he was able to get them to bring all of the abducted and kidnapped children that they had to the same place. We did three separate scenes on the same day. One in Cartagena in which they brought 54 children. Almost every one of them was under the age of, of 16 years old. More than half of them were kidnapped, many from other countries. And there, the other ones were in Medellin and Armenia, Colombia all simultaneous things. We call it Operation Triple Take. These guys show up with all of these children and we put the children in a separate part of the house because they were already traumatized enough. We want them seeing the guns and the money changing hands, et cetera. And we're sitting down at this table and Fuego, one of the, one of the traffickers, he stands up and he goes, Pablo, he said, I, I, have, I wanna show you the gifts that I brought you. And Matt, this changed my whole life right here. He went in the house, he was in there for about 10 minutes and you could hear two of the children crying. They were so scared of coming out and meeting us. In fact, there's a CBS article that, that goes through this and you can see my, my face is blurred out and whatever. They were so scared of meeting us. And 10 minutes later, he comes out and he has four virgins scared to death. Three little girls, one little boy. This little boy was 11 years old. They gave him cocaine that morning because he was so scared. What kind of effed up monster thinks that that's attractive? You know, every cell in my body wanted to just hug these kids, say, you're gonna be fine. You're gonna see your parents again. I couldn't say that. I, I, I'm standing in front of this little girl. She's 11 years old. Standing up, she wasn't much taller than I was sitting down. And there was tear stains on her makeup face. And, and, and every cell in my body wanted to just say, you're going to be fine. You're going to see your parents again. I, and, and she, she was standing there and I, I took her little hands and, and I asked her, I said, Como se llama? what's your name? And she didn't know her name. I, I'm sure that's because her real name wasn't princess. That's what the traffickers were calling her. She was so scared. And, and I just said, Esta bien, it's okay. She went back in the house and the most beautiful moment of my life after, up to that point was, was after the agents came and stormed the party and arrested everybody. 30 child protective services people came in with the children and they started laughing and singing with the children just to calm them down. And that laughing and singing, that sound of freedom was the most beautiful sound that I ever heard. I started crying. That's why we named the movie, The Sound of Freedom. And they weren't supposed to tell the kids that we were the good guys, but somebody must have said something because that little girl that was standing in front of me with the tear stains in her makeup face, she was standing there by the window. Her hand was on the window. She was crying again, but, but she was smiling and waving at us. And she said in her broken English, she said, thank you, Americans. I just broke down. And I turned to, to Sean, who's now the AG. And I said, I saw you, that changed my whole life. I said, I make, I spent my whole life making rich people richer. I want to make a difference. I want, I want to, you tell me what I need to do. I, I'll write a big check. I'll, I was going to buy a, a Lamborghini. I was going to buy a Ventadora that year. And I said, you know what? I'm going to write the check. I want to, I want to figure out how to make a difference. And he said, Paul, he said, here's how you can make a difference. He said, unfortunately, the majority of demand for this horrible act in second and third world countries comes from wealthy men in first world countries who look and dress and talk like you. He said, I can't teach my Navy SEALs how to wear a $4,000 suit and a $50,000 watch and negotiate a multi-million dollar deal. He said, and I, I don't know of any ultra successful business owners who's had the training that you've had. He said, if, if you're willing to be the bait, they'll change your whole life. So that was 10 years ago. And I've led, led or been involved with over 70 undercover rescue missions in the last 10 years. Yeah. And the, and the, the, these, mission, these missions are always in the third world countries, are they? Or, or, or have you, you actually had done them in, in first world countries too? We've, we've done them all over. I've, I've led rescue missions in 15 countries, but the majority of the problem are in places like Southeast Asia, Latin America, but, uh, but we've done rescues in, in Africa and India and, and uh, a lot of other places. So. It's a problem. And, and so, do, do, the, do the kids always get back to their parents at the end as well? Uh, you know, as in like, I mean, do, you, do you even know who their parents are? Do they know yeah, who their parents are? If their parents, if their parents reported them abducted, then it's easy to find them and it's easy to get them back. If they didn't, sometimes the parents were involved, you know, really? it, 
In Southeast Asia, more than half the children that we rescued in places like Thailand, more than half of those children were sold by their own families. Wow. And if that happens, we don't want to get them back to the same family and have them be sold again. So we find them healthy homes. We've got thousands of families that are, there's families all over the world that are, that are willing to sacrifice the next 10 to 50 years of their life with a challenged child. They maybe don't have the money to be able to, to, to make it happen. So we help raise money. We've had some, some other foundations that we have funded that, that specifically focus on the legal work to get those children into healthy homes. Well, to tell, tell me about the Child Liberation Foundation. I mean, that, that, is, that, is that something you founded recently or, or, or was, that, was that at the beginning of this journey yeah, 10 years ago? Yeah, so, so we were with some other foundations in the beginning and about five years ago, we wanted to make sure that we knew where every penny was going, that we knew that every penny was going to the rescue, rehabilitation and reuniting of children with their families. A lot of foundations out there uh, are, are well-meaning, but a lot of them have uh, have high overhead and, and they're using the money to promote their own logo or, or different people's ego, et cetera. And so we funded a lot of different groups and I have, I have, uh, I have a lot of love for the organization that, that brought me on in the beginning. But the Child Liberation Foundation, we started about five years ago. Its mission is eradicating child trafficking. And we have funded lots of other organizations and given them money to help go undercover and rescue kids. And we've done a whole bunch of that as well. But the transition that's happened recently, and this is the reason why we're even talking publicly, I've come to a realization that just going undercover and rescuing 20 children at a time is never going to fix the problem. This problem 10 years ago when I started is worse today than when we started. And I've led 70 missions and the other foundations have led hundreds and hundreds of missions. And there's still a challenge out there and it's still growing. And the reason behind it, you cannot fix a problem by just pulling the kids out. You have to, you have to fix the demand. But, but, but I mean, I was going to say, you know, I mean, how, how do you do that? Because I mean, you know, we, we talk in general about, you know, when, when you just go and do something for someone, you know, if you haven't educated them, uh, you know, then, then it's just going to repeat, etc. But I mean, how, how, how the fuck do you remove the demand on something like this? Because, because I mean, you're not, you're not talking about a lack of education. I mean, you're talking about absolute fucking psychopaths and horrendous people. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. We're here, here's, here's the challenge, Matt. I believed for a long time that the people who were going down and doing these horrible things, I, I, thought, I thought that it was tied to pornography addiction, where when, when you go from taking a woman from a divine feminine to an object, you start going down a dark road. And for a lot of them, that dark road, they, they start wanting, they're addicted and they want something harder to have that same fix. And for some of them, harder is a little bit younger, a little bit younger. And pretty soon they're fantasizing about something they wouldn't have even thought was attractive five years ago. And then they're acting out on these horrific fantasies. That's, that's where I thought all the demand was coming from. But I, I, I've come to an understanding recently as I've really looked at some numbers and looked at the people that are involved. I've come to an understanding that yes, 8 million ch children is, is an unfathomable number, but it's small compared to what the real problem is. And here's the real problem. One out of every five men here in the US and likely even more overseas, one out of every five, 20% of all men have experienced sexual violence against them sometime in their life. And one fourth of them experienced it under the age of 10 years old. That is 200 million men who've experienced that type of violence before the age of 10 years old. And they're growing up with this, this trauma that is deep buried inside of them. And some of them, they grow up with big egos and big money and they're thinking deep inside, oh, I was raped as an eight year old. It's not gonna hurt if I rape somebody else, right? It's this really fucked up version of what, what sexuality is. Now that number is double when it comes to women. 40% of all women have experienced sexual violence. And one fourth of all women, a billion women on this planet, it happened as a child. So we've got generational trauma. And if we can figure out how to help 
people heal. Not just, I mean, everybody can get all excited. Yeah, let's go in and rescue these kids, rescue these kids. I'll tell you this right now, Matt, if you, if you put me in a room and you said, Paul, you've got a hundred pedophiles and you've got a hundred traffickers and you've got one hour and you can either have a gun with no retribution for an hour or you can have a microphone. I would take the microphone and that would be the most transformational 60 minutes of their life. I would take them into the pit of hell. I would show them the depravity of the direction that they're going and what they have done. I would pull them out and I would at least point them in the direction and teach them how they can let go of all that bullshit and get to a point where they can live a healthy life. Now, I'm still gonna lock them up because they need to spend some time to make sure they can never hurt another child again, period. But I believe that there's a pathway to healing. And on that note, I can do the same thing. You put 2000 men, just average off the streets, me realizing that 20% of them in that room have experienced that type of trauma and the other ones, third party have experienced it in some way in dealing with maybe a parent or a grandpa or an uncle or whatever else. And there's this trauma everywhere and teaching people how to heal and how to, how to tie into this, this beautiful light that is inside of each one of us and learn to listen in a way that it can guide us in our lives so that we're not going down these dark roads. That's the answer. I've come to an understanding that my role is not just rescuing a 10 year old from the clutches of a trafficker in, in Ecuador. My role is helping to rescue the 10 year old inside of every man and woman who has dealt with some degree of trauma in their life and help heal that trauma before they become contact offenders. If you understand where I'm going with that, I believe that a huge number of the people who are doing these atrocities had trauma themselves. So if I can help them heal that trauma before they cause that trauma on others, we're going to save millions of children, not just 20 at a time. We just um, just, just had, a, had a comment on here, actually, um, it says, says um, I've raised 17K for charities while I was working three jobs and building my business. The reason is because I was fostered five times, moved homes 32 times, abused for seven years, and I'm open about this. But I see a lot of solutions to a, a, lots of abuse situations because I was in it. It's one reason that I'm building the business the way I am. My abuser was a sadistic, barbaric pedo. He was abused by his uncle and brought that to my life. And that's uh, that's where One Tough Peach came from. Uh, the exactly, exactly. So his trauma, this, I'm, I'm so grateful that there are people like this who have, instead of doing what was done to him, which was a pass on of trauma. So what came to him was a chain reaction. Somebody was had trauma, somebody else had trauma. And what's exciting about that guy is that tr generational trauma is stopping with him. Instead of allowing it to destroy him and putting him into a place where he could destroy others' lives, he instead decided to take that trauma and build a successful company, raise money for charities, that's the type of people who are going to change the world is the guys who stop that trauma in one generation. I love it. So tell me, because I mean, undoubtedly people who are listening to this or, or watch this, uh, you know, when we when we um, produce it off, off the live version over the next few weeks, they're going to be both uh, have their minds opened and want to get involved because I mean, I guess we've all heard of, of child trafficking, of, of, of human trafficking, but probably, I mean, I certainly never had any concept of the, of the scale of it and like you say there's, there's the published scale and there's and the, and there's the true scale how can people get involved you know, what can they do whether that's uh, something to do with your foundation or just 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 in general how, how can people make a difference in this well here's what's exciting the guy that just texted in that's what everybody can do you know you don't have to get involved with my foundation if you want to you can go to liberateachild.org or liberate children Org, or just look for Child Liberation Foundation and you'll find us. There's some great resources and stuff there or do what he's doing, you know, help out with foster homes and because he's been through some and or raise money for different types of charities that are in your area that are making a difference. They can get some 
more information on what I'm doing. Moving forward, I'm writing some books that will be out later this year that I really believe are going to make a powerful impact in the lives of everybody that, that is fighting this. And uh, you can follow me on, on paulhutchinsonofficial.com. You can go to Instagram or Facebook or, or LinkedIn to just look up Paul Hutchinson Official and you'll find me. I'm, I'm gonna get something shorter because Paul Hutchinson Official is kind of long. I'm, I'm thinking of something like, I don't know, Soul Healer 007 and something like that. I don't know. The, the, the Hutch. The Hutch. The Hutch, that's right. <laughs> the Hutch. So, so yeah, I would love to, to and, and if anybody has connections with great people like you, Matt, that have podcasts, that have platforms, I'm willing to do podcasts every day and share from my heart and help people see the light and, and, and understand what's going on in the world and get involved with, with whatever charity. And I'll, I'll tell you this, it doesn't have to be this charity. Find something that you're passionate about. I don't care if it's saving the trees or saving the wells or saving the kids, whatever it is, find something that you're passionate about that you can make a difference in. And not just write a check, but get physically involved in making a powerful, positive impact in the world. And the, the blessings that will come to you as you build your business will be tenfold. And I have so many examples of making that decision to write the big checks, to help out people who really needed help. And boom, these beautiful things would happen. I found that if I worked really hard at my financial goals, I had decent results because I worked my ass off. But if I worked really hard and try to have a powerful, positive impact on the lives of others, I had enormous results in my business goals. And, and, and they very seldom do those results come from my own efforts. They always came from, you know, call it karma, call it what you want to. Beautiful things will happen in your, your journey to success as you prioritize your time and your money to making a difference in the lives of others. Well, Paul, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, buddy. And, uh, you know, it's, it's certainly been an eye-opener for me, an interesting warm-up talking about business and then a, a very eye-opening and, uh, I guess, a saddening but inspiring at the same time, you know, co conversation about uh, about the, the people trafficking. So, and like you say, um, I, I will do what I can to introduce you to some other people where you can where you can share your story and share your message because uh, it's been absolutely fascinating and, uh, you know, I'm sure there's so much that people can do. As you said, I mean, you can people can get you on uh, official, was it Paul Hutch? Hutchinson official, Paul official. Hutchinson official. There's no G in Hutchinson, just H U T C H I N S O N, Paul Hutchinson official.com or on Facebook or LinkedIn. I'm be sharing a lot of, a lot of, uh, different links to podcasts and things that we're doing or get involved with liberateachild.org or liberatechildren.org and uh, you can see us there. And we'll we'll put in all the show notes on this as well. Uh, you know, I know some of you guys are watching this not live now, we're listening to it live. For everyone who who, hit, who hears the after version, all the information will be in the show notes and we'll put some, some good links through to Paul and his organizations and, and backstory and everything as well. So thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for listening. If you've been listening or watching live, thank you very, very much. We, we don't get to do these live too much anymore but thanks uh, thanks paul for uh for, for, for bra braving the chance to uh, to make any mistakes in public and uh when you guys get to hear this over the next couple of weeks i'm sure i'm sure you'll love it too so thanks a lot as always i've been the matt haycox that's t-h-e-m-a-t-t-h-a-y-c-o-x on all things social if you've been watching this on youtube you can hear it on the audio versions on itunes on spotify wherever you listen to your podcasts and if you've been listening to the audio versions jump on over to youtube and you can see my pretty face too until the next time thank you very much for watching beautiful